this is the story of the Bay Sea One Ton Monster. All right. <laughs> I am the Daisy One Ton Monster. And you know what I eat? I eat Daisy One Ton. And you know what that is? Daisy One Ton? I like. Basie. <laughs> Basie one quickly The street tongue of Chinatown never was proper English or good Chinese, but it worked, and we weren't ashamed of it. Then teachers in public school and Chinese from China told us what we talked was good for nothing. It was Mr. Ma who said that for us, both English and Chinese were foreign languages, and started us talking again. He said, we didn't have a Chinaman's chance in hell. That's a white expression that we used to use, use on each other before we took to, to knives and sharpened pencils in the yard. That was a long time ago. Chinaman's chance in hell meant that here, in America, we were in hell. We were non-Christians, we had no souls. That in America, we were doomed. What's a Chinaman's chance worth today? Well, that's a question that uh, Chinese Americans are asking themselves in Chinatowns all over the country. New York, San Francisco, Seattle, Los Angeles, Boston. They're asking what is a Chinese American today? And what being here for seven generations has cost us? In 1960, 30,000 Chinese in New York, 262,000 in the nation. 61% of us American born and living outside of Chinatown. America praised us for assimilating without violence. In 65, the quota of 105 Chinese entries a year was lifted and changed Chinatown. Today, the population, at least double that of 1960, is predominantly immigrant, crowded into the Chinatowns of San Francisco, where I come from, and New York. In New York, four to six people occupy two-room apartments, and every apartment by state standards is substandard. Instead of being the assimilated engineers of the 60s, or the immigrant underemployed of the 70s, whole families work and earn less than nine grand a year. 6.7% of us are out of jobs. In World War II, we were played off against the Japanese and called America's loyal minority. In today's press, because we're not black, we're loved as the law-abiding minority. Because we're immigrants, we're a problem. Because of Red China, we're a mystery. Since our arrival here in 1840, we've been told who we are and done none of the telling. In 1934, someone wrote, I hope that someone will arise before this generation has passed to record that conquest of affection by which the California Chinese transformed themselves from our race adversaries to our dear subject people. In New York of the 70s, it might be better said, but that's the only difference. Borough President Percy Sutton. I think that the Chinese of all of the nationalities that are in America, and I've held to this view for a very long time, seem to me to be the most stabilizing influence. And that is, they are people of great serenity. And sometimes I often think they're almost too patient, who have a great deal of patience, great deal of perseverance, who are concerned about education. Certainly the community that I come from, which is the black community, has a lot to learn from the Chinese community. I think that the Chinese community 
has so much to give. And one of the things they have to give, as I said, is the high value they place on education and family life. We invited the mayor and Senator Javits to Chinatown. They were busy. Maybe Chinatown voting power wasn't enough to attract them. We're less than 1% of the population. About 10% of that less than 1% is registered to vote. Well, once we formulated the Chinatown Advisory Council back in uh, February of 1970, a year and a half ago, under the borough president, we organized into various committees, one of which was the Education Committee, of which I'm chairman. And we are proud to say after a year and a half of diligent work, we have accomplished the impossible, which is to have a, a Chinatown language center to teach English to the new immigrants, which will be for 750 students. This is a small step, but we expect that this will be a big leap in terms of a model for the future. Uh, How many different kinds of Chinese are there in Chinatown? What, what are we talking about? The Chinese in the uh, United States uh, as, uh, are about uh, three different types. First is we have the um, China-born Chinese, or the uh, CBC, and then the American-born Chinese, the ABC. Now, lately, we have also the BBC. Uh, what are you, uh, ABC, which is the, uh, or Which is the uh, British, uh, uh, born in the British territories. Okay? All right. And aside from that, we have uh, now Chinese from Africa, Chinese from uh, Southeast Asia, so it's very hard to uh, say, but the biggest group, I would say, is this three that I mentioned before. And I would say that the, it is very important that the United States, the people in New York, come to um, visit with us and we visit with them. I will, uh, although I'm not the mayor of Chinatown, but I think any Chinese would say this, that we welcome President Nixon to visit here in Chinatown, and we welcome uh, Governor Rockefeller to visit in Chinatown. How about us being a minority? Are we getting all the benefits? Well, uh, being a minority, the Chinese people, as of today, is not recognized as a minority, as Commissioner Chin said, that we are finally getting that recognition as soon as uh, that bill is passed in Congress. Um, well, what would you like, if that bill gets passed, we are recognized as a minority? Well, then I would like to see that more federal funds is poured into this community, the Chinatown community, so we get our share of what the other community are getting, the minority group. Mr. Key, you were a candidate for the state assembly. That's right. Last year, I was the only Chinese-American candidate for state assembly in New York, and uh, I was proud to, to uh, come out for my people and to try to give them the recognition, though I didn't have a, a Chinaman's chance, but these people back me up and they now want a, a voice in the community. So maybe if not today, tomorrow, we might be in the limelight again. Uh, I, I Irving Chin, Commissioner of Human Rights, Theodore D, President of the Chinatown Advisory Council, Charles Key, Vice Chairman of the Liberal Party, or the Maoist Uwur Kun, might become the political spokesman of Chinatown. With the recognition of Communist China, Chinatown's longtime spokesman, the pro-nationalist Chinese Benevolent Association will lose power and influence over everything but its Chinese school. Chinese from China to come here. For two hours every afternoon after what we called American school, we were off the streets and in Chinese school. Most were started by white missionaries in the 19th century when we were barred from the public schools. They still run some. The largest, though, is run by the Chinese Benevolent Association. Now, I never liked uh, going to Chinese school until the old teacher died and and I met Mr. Ma, the new teacher. He was skinny. He wore his clothes like lunch, wears a paper sack. Best man I ever met. He talked about Ch Chinese America. He said it was all right not to be Chinese from China. He said it was all right not to be white American. This was, this was new. This was something no Chinese American had ever said. No, no American white teacher had ever said before. And he'd come in and he'd talk about how the Chinese had 
were called Chinamen. The, the Chinese that built the railroads that they collapsed mines on, paved over and built towns on, made laws against. But these Chinese, these Chinamen, they'd fought, but that the fights had been forgotten. And that their children's children, not their children's children's children, should be proud of them. Shouldn't be ashamed of the name Chinaman. And that we were the children's children's children. disappeared after that. To the five of us, he was like a character in one of these Chinese sword slingers we watched between westerns. The old master and the strongest fighter. We, his protégés. The elements of the sword slinger, an old master and his school of martial arts. A protégé who leaves on a mission of personal vengeance. A journey that ends with him joined to a group of good guys. Together, they showdown against the invincible villain who represents individuality run amok. It's not the same image of our manhood we got from the Fu Manchu and Charlie Chan movies. Both the evil Fu and the benign Charlie Chan portrayed the Chinese male as effeminate in manners and speech. Chan was a servant, an educated step and fetch it, who kept his hands at his sides and kept his place. America might have loved Chan, but it was racist love. 47 Chan movies were made, and in none of them was Chan ever played by a Chinese actor. Instead, America praised Warner Rowland, Sidney Toller, and Roland Winters for their realistic portrayals. We could only watch. Roland Winters is the last surviving Charlie Chan. Do you remember any of the Chanisms, the things he used to say? Uh, oh, yes. There was one line that I think was in every Chan movie, whether they were the ones that I made or those that Warner Rowland made or Sidney Toller. And that was at the end of the show. The detective would mm -hmm. always say, well, there you are, Mr. Chan. We've got your murderer right here. And it was a good job. And Chan always said, torn with grief to disagree. But Mr. So-and-so, not murderer, true murderer is Mr. So-and-so. And that torn with grief to disagree was always there. Then also another phrase that he used constantly was, woman like blossom of plum." Now, why like black or plum, I really don't know. Uh, I know some women that look like plums, but, <laughs> right. but uh, the blossom of, well, it was a poetic license, I guess. So are there any characteristic Chinese gestures you studied to play Chan? No, uh, I just uh, remembered in, with the Chinese that I had known before I played the part, that they uh, were very reserved in gesture. They did. They used their hands very little in their speech. I mean, unlike an Italian, for example, or a Frenchman who speaks with his hands a great deal. I've never found this to be true with Orientals, so I used my hands as little as possible. <coughs> well, as you might have read, uh, NBC and uh, Universal Studios uh, combining together to revive Charlie Chan as a television yes. series. And David Tebbett, Vice President in charge of talent for NBC, went looking for a, an Oriental actor to play Chan for a change. And the only stipulation was that, besides being a good actor, of course, that he speak English in a way that was understandable in the United States. Uh, and what strikes me as odd is that he failed and, and cast Ross Martin in yeah. the part. Oh. Why? Uh, well, I don't know. You know, I, yeah. I really don't know uh, how they made out with Chinese actors. I'm sure that there are plenty of them who can play the part. But uh, perhaps uh, uh, part of the charm of it is the fact that it is an Occidental playing an Oriental. That may be it. It's like, a, hmm. like an Irishman playing an Italian or vice versa. Yeah. You know, that may lend a little spice to the wooing. <laughs> Say... I mean, what would you do? Say some angry young Chinese American, uh, or even an immigrant came up to you dressed in black, walking bad, talking dirty, toothpick in his mouth, and, and asked you and said, how can you 
defend yourself? How can you justify the Chan movies and, and the port portrayals of Chan and the sons? Well, I think at my age, I just turn around and run. <laughs> or a little younger, why that's different. But at this stage of the game, forget it. Betty Lee Sung, author of Mountain of Gold, writes that much to their credit, the Chinese have a healthy attitude toward prejudice. She says, quote, they have never been overly bitter. Her book, one of five books published by American-born Chinese, is the only one still in print. And it has now gone into paper, and it's been translated in a bootleg edition in Chinese. Uh, why do you say it's a healthy attitude to, to not be overly bitter toward discrimination? I think that if you hold a grudge, it handicaps you in whatever your uh, goals may be. And also, I think that um, uh, if you project yourself and uh, uh, make yourself obnoxious in many ways. Am I obnoxious? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, do you think uh, not being overly bitter toward discrimination was respons partly responsible for the slackening off? Of no, that's not, tr uh, that's not uh, the way I see it. Uh -huh. Uh, it was the other way around. The conditions were better. China was at war uh, with Japan and allied with the United States. Uh, the civil rights movement rose, uh, came up, and the Chinese rode the crest of that. Uh, the whole climate change, and I think uh, uh, the Chinese themselves also came into the mainstream, and uh, 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 this changed yeah. the climate so that we have mean? a more favorable social climate. What do you mean by the mainstream? Uh, you mean publishing a lot of books, uh, getting into the culture, a lot of Chinese artists and writers now? Moving dancing. out of Chinatowns, uh -huh. uh, getting jobs where you were formerly restricted to just a few uh, menial jobs, um, being accepted socially, not being excluded from certain areas. Uh, these you? are what I call being uh, in a better position. Uh, the Chinese are also uh, uh, have changed in their outlook toward this country because formerly they came here only as sojourners. In other words, just to make enough money to go back to China where they would be uh, received and uh, they wouldn't experience any of these difficulties. But the idea was to get enough money to go back so that they could maintain this lifestyle. Well, what makes you feel that uh, the Chinese that came over between 1840 and say 1941 when they couldn't go back because of World War II, what, what makes you believe that uh, they had no intention of staying here? Because uh, the, lar the number of Chinese leaving the country almost every year was uh, larger than the numbers coming in. The statistics don't say how many of those departing Chinese were deported or dead. The dead traveled as paying passengers like the living. The numbers also don't show the illegal entries, families who came, settled here, and lived in fear of deportation for seven generations. Legally, only men were allowed into the country. Without women, they were denied their manhood by law, herded into Chinatowns by law, humiliated and discouraged from staying. And if they did stay, the Chinese problem, so-called by those who feared a large yellow population, would eventually die out. Many old men did die, and our population dropped suddenly. Some lived without women, without a hope of ever leaving America alive or with honor. And in the 20s and 30s, America put their agony to music and danced. Tin Pan Alley ground out songs like Little Chinky Butterfly and Hong Kong Dream Girl. We never complained because we were afraid of being obnoxious. In every dream you see, girl, two almond eyes are smiling. And my poor heart is whirling like a big sail around my pigtail. I dream of you till dawning but early in the morning oriental dream is gone china boy is so forlorn hong kong dream girl goodbye for every 10 stories i heard about us being docile and passive there maybe was one story of a Chinaman, fast fist, bad mouth, street savvy man a kid could look up to. Someone like Ben Fee, 
Frisco's stories about him were so old, I thought he was dead. I found him alive in New York, 63 years old, still tough, organizing for the Garment Workers Union. Well, we're here to tie in the town cowboy. Yeah, Welcome. well... Welcome. I, uh, I hear you used to do some hard stopping yourself in, uh, in San Francisco. Well, just a long time ago, and uh, things are quite different. We went through the same thing like the Nico people are doing, fighting for ego rights and things like that. And um, we have a lot of interesting stories. I heard one uh, about you in a restaurant on, in near Chinatown. Yeah, there was a uh, restaurant on uh, Venice Avenue, Geary Street, and uh, called Almond Blossoms. By right, that should be a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Almond Blossoms. And yet, uh, I remember when I went in there and uh, wanted to order some food, and the waitress said, um, I'm sorry, um, I have no prejudice against China, which you heard a lot, yeah. But the manager should have something to say about it. Then the manager came and he said, he had no objection. Some of his best, best friends are Chinese, and, but the customer would object. So he, they refused. So uh, as a kid, we don't know any better. We organized something and tried to win that restaurant over. So uh, we count the counter and the 10 seats on the counter. And the most expensive item at that time is a 375 porterhouse steak. <laughs> so we get 10 American kids and uh, come in and occupy every seat on the counter. And then I myself, a Filipino, and a Japanese friend we get on the table. And the waitress said, oh, gentlemen, you're here again. Uh, she said something's happening. Um, she said, repeat the same story again. She had no objection. Then the manager came, and again, the manager had no objection. It's all the fault of the customer. Then we raised the voice. Why should the customer object to us? So these 10 boys get up and say, what's the matter? So I asked them, I said, gentlemen, I said, we never met before. <laughs> I said, why do you object to us to eat here? Well, they say, we don't object. Who said we object? I said, the manager. So, oh, he said, no. They say, on the contrary. If they don't serve you, we will object. So they start walking out. By the time one side of the steaks are cold, smell very nice, there's about $38 business. And as they walk out, the manager begin to get uh, panicky. He run back and forth, look at the steak and look at the customers. And finally, he capitulated. He agreed to serve us, and uh, we went over that region. That's the first region we can get outside of Chinatown. When was this? This is about the 1932-33, yeah. yeah. And uh, did you do this on a regular basis? I mean, <laughs> Oh, we do it in barber shops. We get friends there, get half shaved, and walk out, half of their hair cut, and walk out. You they don't, when the Chinese come, they don't serve. And it's pretty effective. How many shops are there? The see, they are growing up like mushrooms the last year. See. Last week, we about six new shops over now. We have about 165 now in China now. That is about 10 years ago, that's about 30. So that's about six-fold growth. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many women do these shops employ? The, the average would be about 35 to a shop. I think the total must be uh, over and beyond 4,000. So become a very important industry in Chinatown because uh, we need the woman folk to subsidize the uh, income of the family. A man alone will not be able to uh, earn enough. So this become a very important. Uh, the uh, do the sweatshops of the old days do they still exist in Chinatown? No, they don't. You don't have anything like stress something where there's no child neighbor and there's no homework and and the worker have a right to negotiate and with uh, the employer about prices and things like that. Hello. Uh, my name is uh Yun Ying Kong. Yun Ying Kong. Uh, Ms. Mr. Kong is a um, elected by the member of the union working the shop and she represents them when there's small grievances mm -hmm. to try to settle it. And when it's impossible for her to settle, she called the union, and I usually come down and try to help uh, settle the um, grievances. Uh, anywhere from question of prices and working conditions 
the question over time and things like that. Uh, um. About how long? Uh, how long have you been here? Uh, how long you been in America? Uh, five years. Old. Five years. You've been uh, in America five years, and your mother. My mother. Are you working here? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is her mother. Oh. Uh, yeah. This is Mrs. Huang. Uh, she's been here about two years. So it's... Uh, and this is my yeah. sister. Does your husband work? Yeah. Where's your man? Uh, restaurant. Joe Cherry or Kate? No. Oh, yeah. No, the waiter. Oh, waiter. And uh, how many people live in your uh, apartment here? Four. And how many rooms is your apartment? Uh, two. Two rooms and four yeah. people? And, and is it two rooms and a kitchen, or just one All room? All together. All together? Yeah. No bathroom? No. <laughs> I got, yeah, small. Yeah. <laughs> well, I noticed as you walk oh, through... look at her, what's she doing? Yeah. Why do people... I noticed as you walk through, people are always touching you. What is... Why is that? Uh, this is a uh, awesome thing. Um, somehow they feel like um, not many uh, people will do things for them without demanding money or some kind of a uh, reward from them. I mean, somebody would do something for them voluntary. Uh, they almost seem to like to touch you and see if you're real or not. Yeah. And this all makes me an awesome feeling. That, uh, well, you're real. Yeah. I've uh, spent most of my life down here. I've been uh, full-time in the school system down here since 1961. Came originally in 58 part-time. In fact, some of my friends tell me that really I make my bed in Brooklyn, but I live down here. <laughs> Every Friday night, Ben Fee teaches English in classes sponsored by the Garment Workers Union. His 24-year-old son, Clifford, teaches science in Chinatown's Junior High School 65. Frank D'Amico is an assistant principal at Junior High 65, where the walls are falling apart and the teaching is tough. Okay. Uh... Okay, I'm a young, I'm, I'm a young Chinese kid, and uh, I come to school, and I, I don't know really what's happening. There's a Chinese on this side, and there's uh, the Spanish on this side, and the Puerto Ricans. Yeah, I'm out in the street. I got nothing to do. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what's happening in the rest of the country outside of Chinatown. It's a funny world to me. Uh, and all I have is the gangs. Now. And for some reason, I'm sent in to talk to you. Yeah. What do you say? Yeah, I, I understand your problem because so many of our kids are hung up along the same fashion. Is that not really a question of what do you say to the kid? It's a question of uh, using certain techniques, counseling techniques, to get the kid to start listening to himself. And you get him to start realizing the content of his own emotions, and then he starts picking it out. You really do very little talking. He's doing the talking, and you're sort of a mirror, and you're bouncing it back to him. That's just not a, a five-minute, ten-minute deal. You're working with a kid now over a period of weeks and months. Do the Chinese kids here look to the Chinese teachers as models? I think they do. I think it's a very natural thing. He, uh, imagine a kid from Hong Kong. Uh -huh. And he, uh, or, or a girl or a boy, and he sees uh, someone like Virginia Key at my school, or uh, Jim Lee, or George Chin, Harry Chin. Well, you know, I could go on. Uh, I don't even know how many teach Chinese teachers we have come to think of. But anyhow, <coughs> if that person can make it, by golly, I can make it. He can identify more easily mm -hmm. with that person, all other things being equal, than he can with me. The attitude that... Uh... Chinese men are not men. The stereotype of us is of having no style of manliness of our own is so deeply ingrained that a white writer, I guess the guru to the white intellectuals, the eye and mouth of God, Tom Wolfe, wrote in, uh, in Esquire magazine in November, <coughs> December 1969. I mean, he bought this line and he wrote, uh, about Chinese teenagers attending an integrated school. He says that ch the Chinese teenagers found that Chinese culture, obedience, filial piety, 
hard work, self-respect didn't mean a damn thing. Being a cool and badass cat, that was all that mattered. The gangs ran the show, the Bloods and the Mexicans, but mainly the Bloods. They were loud, violent, sexually aggressive, stuff that really stunned most Chinese, implying that, that we, mm -hmm. we have none of that. But it was the Bloods who ran the show. And if it was the Bloods who ran the show, maybe the thing to do was to get it on their thing. That was when one really started seeing some exotic sights in Chinatown. Here came the kids who really had the gait, man, down pat, that cool, rolling gait with the hips and the shoulders turning over like the wheels of a railroad engine. <sighs> Fantastic. Obviously, the wealth came from Hong I Kong. I don't buy it. Can't buy it at all. Look, let's take a look at uh, the ethnic census, the latest ethnic census of my school. Uh, we have 62.6% .6 Chinese. 21% Puerto Rican, 4.1% Spanish-speaking non-Puerto Ricans, 6.6% Blacks, and 5.8% Caucasian. Who's learning from whom? Sam Sapola is a street worker from Young Life, one of several groups working with Chinatown youth. Like most groups, Young Life looks to the community for its support, and the community is poor. Sam hangs out in Chinatown where the kids hang out. He too grew up in the neighborhood. Chinatown youth first knew him as a driver salesman for Pepsi-Cola, when Chinatown was his territory. Sit down. You guys know Sam? Smile. Yes, Sam. You know Sam? Yes. You like Sam? Yes. Oh, how come you all say it together? What do you do to him, Sam? You beat him up? Say no. <laughs> now, how do you keep tabs of the kids? How do you, uh... We're on the street with them. Uh, yeah. We're on the street most of the time with them, or we're in the schools. If there's any kids that are absent, we uh, check the attendance sheets and uh, see why they're absent, if they're playing hooky or if they've just got a problem and yeah. they, they just can't hack it. So we try and give them as much as we can. Well, say a kid's on the hook. He's been on the hook a week. What do you do then? Well, I go out looking for him. And uh, once I find him, I try and find out what his problem is. And uh, whether it's for school, I try to solve it. If he's been left back, I'll try to get him pushed ahead if he's uh, doing the right work and he's attending school. Have you, have you had any successes so far? Well, I think so. We've got, uh, I would say, 20 kids that were out of school. We've put them back in school, and they're all in college right now. All so. 20? All 20. Fantastic. You know Mario Frieda and the cops? No, I'm, uh, Sam has been our link with them, and uh, usually when they want to know what's happening in Chinatown, they come to see him. <laughs> Chinatown is this area bounded by Broadway Canal and the Bowery at one time, but it's growing to such proportions that it's going north into what is called Little Italy. And Little Italy, as a result of this, is shrinking. Also, we have Little Puerto Rico here, and here we have a mixture of Irish, Italian, Negro, Chinese, and Puerto Rican. The Chinese are as well coming here and further into the 7th precinct. As I tell you, these are the boundary lines, and this is the 7th Precinct. Greater Chinatown goes as far as 14th Street. Is this causing, uh, Captain Gunderson, uh, is this causing, this spread, causing an increased police problem uh, in the area? Well, whenever you have ethnic, ethnic groups uh, intermingling, and one group uh, supposedly pushing out another group out of an area, you're bound to have conflicts. Chinatown gangs, suddenly, are, are Chinatown gangs new? And uh, are they really as violent and as uh, organized as the papers make out? The, Mario, you can tell them. The gangs of Chinatown are not at all like the structured gangs of uh, the 40s and 50s of the Italian or Negro Puerto Rican gangs. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see possibly it happening or coming in some time in the future. I don't know when. But the gangs of now are not at all like those that I just described. What, are the structure, what is the structure of these old gangs? It, generally, if a kid lives on Mott Street, he's a black eagle, which are the younger kids of the former gang of the white eagles. If he lives or hangs around on Pell and Doyle Street and part of the Bowery, he's the Kuan Yings. 
And uh, these two gangs have been having fights uh, predominantly for a turf, uh -huh. but not so structured like the other former gangs of yesteryear. What are you doing? Taking a picture. There is fair. That's sure. all. What's your name? Huh? <laughs> Probably won't get in the studio, though. No, we'll leave it in. If you want to take pictures of us, it's sure. Yeah. I, I get a, this, uh, you get this <laughs> distinct impression you're a little suspicious of, <laughs> of media here. <laughs> Definitely. Well, shit. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, I don't know where we stand. Okay. Are you sure? What do you feel about this situation? Uh, what situation? You being filmed here, do you, uh... Very unnatural situation. Now, you know what? You're trying to present the opposite stereotypes to what the white media and white society has been playing upon all along. And all along, they've had waiters and houseboys and yeah. pigtails and rituals. And now, we're here mainly because you want a hint of radicalism, a hint of American born, a hint of yeah. people who aren't chasing white gold. You're, you two are American born. Yeah. Uh, you don't have the same problems as, as these uh, immigrant youth. Uh, what are you doing still in Chinatown then? I mean, you're out in the streets with everybody else. Why? Why? When you could be someplace else. Oh, man, well, that, that depends on where your head is at. Right. It's like, if you want to chase, man, a white man's dream, if you want to make it big, man, if you want to make your bread, get out, not give a damn about Chinatown and your people and your culture, man. To become totally assimilated, that's where your head is at. That's where Yacht's head is at. Dig it. You're my friend, man. Yeah. I can dig where you're coming from, man, but I can't dig where you're at, man. What do you want? You want, you want to be a psychologist, right? Yeah. You want to make loads of bread, man. You want to have cars and a house and a couple of garages, man. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, man. But that's not where my head is at, either. See, the thing is, you need somebody to do something for you, man. I don't. It's I can get the people to help me. Maybe I won't, but I'm going to try. And that's the difference. At least I try and have my conscious at stake, man. If you don't even try, man, you don't have nothing at stake. You just, you just forsaken a lot of things that you came out of. <laughs> why, why, like, see, like, you gotta understand, Chinatown has always helped itself, not, not because, you know, like... But has helping they, it, they, have, they, they haven't got help from the outsides, because they don't want to... Like, we're in a different position here. Like, we're, right. we're an odd race in an odd country. All right, let me ask you a question. You're trying to say I should use a Chinese way to, to meet my ends uh, instead of using the, the, white, the white world? To, uh, to achieve my end? But sh should I forfeit my, uh, an education, or should I, should I not go to no. the best of your no, 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 Chinese no. way means that you forfeit the edu your education? Your Listen, I, I, I speak Chinese. I still commu communicate with my parents at home in Chinese. All right, now, I have to tell my culture in that sense. But when I go out in the world, how am I going to speak to white people in Chinese? How am I going to relate to them? My, my am I saying that, that, that Chinese culture is just speaking Chinese and reading a couple of Mandarin books? All right, why? No, we have to relate. How? See, how, I can, how I can I probably speak Chinese, and yet I relate to my people more than you ever did. And you oh, were born right. in China. Right, so? All right, so I'm achieving my goals by, w by what means I, I feel is the best way of, of achieving it. But what you're trying to say is that, uh, not forsaken in education, man, you take whatever you can out of it, man. The educational system, any system, you take whatever you can out of it. It's how you use it. Man. You get your education, you have a tool, you learn how to use it. It's how you use it. Well, what kind of film would you make, you know, if you were making a film about Chinatown? I would make a real film, man, in which a Chinese image where one person yeah. is real, man. A person who, who is living, a person like myself. Like, I, I live from day to day. I mean, I don't have pigtails. My father's a waiter, man. That's the way it goes. I dig it. I am not going to be you know, conforming to some stereotype that white America has. Uh -huh. White America has, has John Wayne, man. They got Paul Newman, Steve McQueen, man. I think Steve McQueen, fine, man. Black America has who? Sweet, sweet back, uh, man, Van Peebles. They've got Jim Brown, you know. What is China got? I mean, Chinese, what have they got? Charlie Chan? Oh, man.
they've got they've got pigtails and rickshaws and man and lachoy commercials and that's i'd like very much to make an image of an asian who can say to the whole white system to the, to every system later for you baby how's the smell of home at home in chinatown stinks Wing Tech Lum, 24, American born of Walter Duke parents, good schools, good grades, engineering degree, no problem with English. He doesn't have to live here, but like many young American born Chinese, now working for agencies like the Chinatown Planning Council, the Chinese Youth Council, the Two Bridges Neighborhood Council here in Chinatown. He chooses to live here, he wants to live here, because America, outside of Chinatown, has somehow failed him, because he wants to help. Working with immigrant youth and American-born youth in Chinatown has sparked a, a new sense of self-awareness in Wayne, a new sense of his Chinese-American identity that he explores and develops not only in his work in the streets out there, but uh, in his poetry. He's the first Chinese American to win the New York Poetry Center Award. Chinatown, that started him writing. A picture of my mother's family is a poem in progress. A picture of my mother's family at a summer home in Ningpo near Shanghai your family circa 1915 poses on the stone floor entryway between the rise of steps and the wood front door. Four girls are spread about the parents who are seated. All are in warm clothing, finely dressed. It is perhaps morning, the coolness captured now in such clear light. They seem somehow as if illumined by beams reflected from the moon. On the right, Ming, the second born my living aunt, has on a dark wool dress and brocaded top of silk that does not cover her sleeves. She tiptoes slightly, for she leans to one side on her hidden right arm, bracing it, would seem, on the edge of her father's chair. Her face, cocked to her right in front of his chest, is plump. The supple mouth I recognize smiles downward, frowning, sad and shy in her own young world. This photograph is hers. Last year, she gave it to me in remembrance of you. This is the Lee family. Mrs. Lee was born and raised in New York. She went to China to marry a man she'd been engaged to for six years and had never met. They bore two children overseas, Priscilla and Howard. Glenn, Sylvia, and Timothy were born in New York. Both parents work full time. In China, Mr. Lee worked for the government. In Hong Kong, he was an accountant. In New York, he cooks in a Chinese restaurant. Is he bitter? He is bitter in his profession. But uh, when, when I returned to this country with my family and with my husband, he, he had to uh, take whatever he can, you know, get. And uh, the, the, you know, best job would be a cook's job. And thereafter, uh, he has stayed on this profession. Did you ever have any doubts about yourself? Uh... I mean, an American-born Chinese girl and uh, a, a boy in China that she's never seen, two different cultures, uh, well, East and West, you know, and all of that. Uh, well, at the time, when I accepted the engagement, well, all I wanted was to be free, to, to continue school and to be free to, you know, uh, not to be uh, cooped up at home. But shortly after the engagement, I met a uh, professor in school. Mm -hmm. And she taught in China for about 24 years. And she was uh, uh, asking me why I feel so sad. And I explained. So she explained this to me. She says, uh, I think that uh, after you listen to what I have to explain, 
I, I'm sure you feel much better. Mm -hmm. And she says that, but I know of the Chi Chinese people, the Chi Chinese culture is the greatest. And you are born here. So when you and your uh, fiance shall, shall meet, that means East shall meet West. And uh, your husband shall extract the best from the uh, East, and you shall ex extract the best from the uh, West. And the two of you will, I'm sure, will have a very beautiful family. Is there Chinese culture in this family? Do you, uh, is, is this the, do you really feel that in this family there is the, the blending of East and West? And uh, Absolutely. Chinese New, New Year. My daughter, uh, my number one daughter, daughter, always plays a big part. And since she's married, now it is my sec second daughter. Would I you? remember Priscilla always made a pot of tea. Jum cha. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. On yeah. New Year's I, Eve, she, yeah. she would pour uh, Daddy and Mommy a cup of tea. She would serve that tea, and then we would uh, start to give out the lucky red packages. See. This is what all the ch children love. See. Not empty red packages. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, well, you're nice seeing... Yes, we we always give uh, a big bill for our. Oh children. wow! When you were a girl, did you jump chop for your parents? Yes, right. You, did you say anything? You say jump boy cha or what? Well, we uh, always say kung kung hei fa choi, and then we say like si dao lo. Hey, that's that one in well, here. Yeah, we're on here. What do you think of being a Chinese American? You think, you think so? What do you think? Me? Yeah, you. Quick. You can not say that again. Huh? It's great to be a Chinese. Yeah. It's great to be a Chinese American. Two of the young men appearing on this program have dated whites. They'd rather it not be known because they felt their parents would be hurt. Surveys show that dating and marriage between Chinese women and white men is more common and less turbulent than mixing Chinese men and white women. Bill Wong is a staff writer for the Wall Street Journal. He has stories to write about Chinatown. Bill and Joyce are married. She's white and tall, he's Chinese and not so tall. They laugh about this among themselves. Other things make them laugh. <laughs> Why <What, laughs> I don't know. It depends on what situation, you know. If I'm with Bill, Bill and I fit in fine, you know, with each other and with our friends. You know, if we're um, in Cleveland, Ohio, um, you know, walking down the street, people are looking at us. If we're in uh, Oakland uh, with his family, then, um, you know, it's a different situation again. You know, um, we're in a family situation, and... Um, I'm the, you know, of course the outsider, but um, I have to be an insider because I'm married to the only son, you know, so <laughs> we have a better situation. And um, Bill's mother sort of keeps me, you know, close by and makes sure I do the right thing, you know. And uh, if we're at a banquet and I use chopsticks, she points out to all her friends, look, look, she's using chopsticks, she can't be all bad, you know. <laughs> but Joyce is really a much more independent girl than this, and, and she's not... She's not really what a traditional Chinese daughter-in-law should be or is because simply the fact is she is not Chinese. So this, you know, creates some, some small problems. Are you more comfortable as, as a couple, individually, in, in or outside of Chinatown? I would have to say outside of Chinatown. I would have to say inside of Chinatown. <laughs> <laughs> okay. George? Bill? Me and Bill grew up together. Same Chinese school. Remember, remember Martin's house? Yeah, I remember him. Yeah, he's all right. We've been here since 1840. In that time, China has seen two revolutions and four major wars. And over here, the seventh generation of Chinese Americans has started school, and 25,000 new Chinese immigrants are entering the country every year. Meantime, the new interest in China has spawned a new interest in Chinatown. So far, this has meant only a revival of the old stereotypes and fancy dress cleverly written articles that further alienate us from our American homeland. Chinatown is part of changing America. It always has been. Its isolation is a matter of popular attitude and prejudice, not fact. Chinatown does not end here. Yeah.